Acts 13 and 14, first missionary journey. Acts 11, church at Antioch, Christians first call Christians at Antioch. Acts 12, the death of James, the release of Peter, and the death of Herod. Acts 13, Paul and Barnabas commissioned and set out on the first missionary journey. Acts 14, Paul and Barnabas at Lystra, finishing the first missionary journey and returning back to Antioch. Now, Acts 15 is very important. God has sent a vision to Cornelius, chapter 10. God sent a vision to Peter, chapter 10. God is opening a wide door. Gentiles are hearing the gospel. Gentiles are believing the gospel. Gentiles are becoming Christians. Now you're having church with Jews and Gentiles in the church. But what does it mean? And how are the two groups going to get along? Because the Gentiles have very, very different lifestyles than the Jews. Last Friday evening in Budapest, I had dinner with someone from India. He grew up in a Christian family. I asked him if he still noticed caste. You know what caste is, C-A-S-T-E. In India, people are ranked according to their caste. The highest caste are called Brahmins. The lowest castes are untouchables. You can't have anything to do with them. They handle the garbage and they do the kind of work that no, no one wants to do. I asked my friend, I said, you're a Christian. Caste is a product of Hinduism. Do you still notice caste? He said, well, yes, I do still notice caste, but it's not because we're racially different. It's just that people from a different caste have a very different way of life, and it's hard to mix with them because we're not interested in the same things. We don't do the same things. We don't live our life in the same ways. We don't have the same values. Well, the church in Jerusalem, or the church in the first century, was going to encounter the same kind of problem. And here's the great question. There, was a, there were practical problems. Are we going to eat with these people? Are we going to eat the same things that they do? Are we going to marry our people, these people? Are our grandchildren going to be brought up as Gentiles? Are they going to be brought up as Jews? Is that what Christianity means? It's a very hard thing for a Jew to think about. And the great question is this. In order to be a Christian, does a Gentile have to first become a Jew? Is it necessary to be a Jew if you're going to be a Christian? After all, Jesus was a Jew. After all, Jesus is the Messiah of Israel. After all, Jesus is the King of the Jews. So it would be normal to assume that in order to be a Christian, if you're a Gentile, you have also to become a Jew. These are kind, the kinds of questions which were being sorted out. So what happens in Acts 15 is that they have a conference. They have a council to make decisions about these great questions, to present the opposing arguments, to debate the issue, to hear from all sides, and to decide together what should be done. So. The first great Christian council is the Council of Jerusalem, and it takes place in Acts 15. There are two opposing parties. One is called the Judaizing Party, and these people who are mainly based in Jerusalem, they argue that nobody can go to heaven, nobody can become a Christian. No one can worship the God of Israel truly unless he first becomes a Jew. Then you have the party of Paul who argues free grace and who says, no, the gospel is for everybody. A person can become a Christian without becoming a Jew. And this is the great thing. Now, you'll find in the New Testament, you see this, for instance, in the book of Galatians, that one word is used to kind of summarize what it means to be a Jew. It's a word that only applies to men. It doesn't apply to women. But it's a word that's used to describe the experience of men and women spiritually. It's the word circumcised or circumcision. 
There is the party of the circumcision. What do the party of the circumcision say? They say you got to be a Jew if you're going to be a Christian. Also called the party of the Judaizers. And we see it in verse 1, Acts 15, 1, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. In other words, unless you submit to the Jewish law and the Jewish ritual, you cannot be saved. Paul and Barnabas argued with those men. They debated those men on this issue. Um, and one way they argued is they said, look, Gentiles are already Christians. They've come to believe. They've exercised their faith. They've received the Holy Spirit. They've been baptized. So the issue is settled. These people are Christians. They're in the family, and they didn't become Jews first. So Paul and Barnabas give a report to the church at Jerusalem, to the council of Jerusalem, and they tell everyone gathered there about the great things that God had done among the Gentiles on the first missionary journey. But there are still people who are unconvinced. Now remember, Paul was a Pharisee. But it says in verse 5 that certain ones of the sect of the Pharisees, that is the other Pharisees who had become Christians, who had become converted, this was hard for them to accept. And they said it is necessary to circumcise them. So all the elders of the people, all the elders of the church, all the apostles came together to talk about this. Now, Peter, who received the vision in Acts 10, Peter, who knew what happened with Cornelius, Peter, who's been told personally by God that the Gentiles are welcome into God's family, Peter did not go on the missionary journey with Paul and Barnabas. And I suppose everybody's waiting to see what he says because remember, he's still recognized as the chief apostle. And he says that the Gentiles have an equal share in the gospel, verse 7, the Gentiles have, uh, God has given the Gentiles the Holy Spirit, and God is now making no distinction between the Gentiles and the Jews. He cleanses the hearts of the Jews by faith. He cleanses the hearts of the Gentiles by faith, not by keeping the law of Moses, but by faith in what Christ has done, not what we do by keeping the law but what Christ has done by fulfilling the law on the cross. Faith in that finished work, that's how we're saved. That's how we get forgiveness of sins. And so he says, um, why are you going to try to make the Gentiles keep the law of Moses? Because you know good and well that even our forefathers, even we can't completely keep the law of Moses. We are saved by grace. They are saved by grace. That's the conclusion of verse 11, and that's what Peter is saying. So now James stands up. Who is James? Look at verse 13. This is not James the disciple. Remember, he died in chapter 12. This is James, the half-brother of Jesus, the son of Mary and Joseph. Christians are divided over this question of whether Mary ever had any children. The Roman Catholics, and I suppose most Orthodox, though I don't know Orthodox theology as well as I know Roman Catholic theology, teach that Mary was always a virgin, that Mary and Joseph never had a normal marriage. We Protestants believe that Mary was a virgin when Jesus was born but that after Jesus was born, Mary and Joseph had a normal marriage and Mary had children with Joseph and one of those children was James. There's even a place in the New Testament where we're told uh, the names of his brothers, James and Jude, even the name of one of his sisters, his sister is mentioned. Um, Roman Catholics say these are cousins. These are not really brothers and sisters. We think they are brothers and sisters, but Christians can be divided over this question. We Protestants believe that this James is the half-brother of Jesus and that this James is um, 
like a pastor in the church of Jerusalem. So he's got a lot of influence and a lot of authority. Paul and Barnabas have spoken. Simon Peter has spoken. And James, who's sort of hosting the conference since he lives in Jerusalem, now it's his turn to speak. And he, be he begins to quote the Old Testament Scripture. And he shows from Scripture that God had the Gentiles in mind all along. Look at Acts 15, 17. All Gentiles who are called by my name. So this is a plan that, that comes from the Old Testament. So in verse 19, he says this. He says, this is what I think. This is my decision, that we don't trouble these Gentiles to try to make them Jews. However, there are some things which are so offensive to the Jews that we're going to ask them not to do those things. Now, this part is a little bit difficult. It's a little bit tricky to try to sort out what's going here because there are three things which are mentioned. What James is saying to the Gentiles is that you know, you have three habits, you Gentiles. You eat meat which is sacrificed to idols. You eat the blood and, and uh, you eat uh, meat from uh, animals which have been strangled. And you're very active in sex outside of marriage, fornication. And we want to ask you not to do that. Okay, now here's the question. Does this mean that we're not supposed to eat rare meat with a little blood running on it? And if it's okay to do that, does that mean that sex outside of marriage is also okay? What's going on here? The Council of Jerusalem at this point is not making a ruling about what all Christians during all times are supposed to do. And let me tell you why we can say that. Later in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, it really doesn't make any difference whether you eat from a meat, eat from meat which is sacrificed to idols. That's really not the point. It makes a difference in terms of people getting offended, but it really doesn't make any difference spiritually. That's what he's saying. Now, there are other verses where sexual immorality is forbidden. Lots of other verses. So, we don't look at this scripture to determine what we can do or what we cannot do today. There are plenty of commandments in the New Testament which govern our behavior as Gentile Christians. But in this situation, when Gentiles were just coming into the church and when it was mainly a Jewish church, remember today the church is mainly a Gentile church. There are hardly any Jews in the church today. We may be members of a church all our lives where there are no Jewish members. That's possible. This is the situation in the first century when the church was mainly Jewish. Are we allowed to practice sex outside of marriage as Christians? No, we are not. Are we allowed to eat rare meat? Yes, we are. How do we determine that? We determine that from the rest of the New Testament, from what the New Testament says. But it's a little bit hard to sort this out. Now, when we first started reading the book of Acts, we talked about this problem, not during this session, but during an earlier session when we first introduced the book of Acts. Here's the problem. Um, you have a command, a command which comes out of the mouth of Jesus in the Gospels, or a command which comes through the epistles from the apostles in the New Testament. A command is clear. We have to be obedient to the command. But what if you have a practice, a pattern? In other words, you read the book of Acts and you see that the first century Christians were behaving in a certain way. 
It's not a command. It's simply an observation of what they were doing. Does that mean we have to do that because they were doing it in that, that way? For instance, you have Christians today who say that we only should have house churches. Why should we have house churches? Well, we should only have house churches because the Christians in the first century had house churches. Well, now God can bless house churches, and God is blessing house churches, and God may call you to worship at a house church. God may call you to start a house church. There's nothing wrong with house churches. They can be a very positive experience. But it is wrong to say that we should only meet in house churches because there's no command only to meet in house churches. There's a pattern, but there's not a command. A pattern does not carry the same weight of authority as a command. Plus, why did they meet in houses? Well, they met in houses because they couldn't afford to build churches. And in many cases, it was illegal to build churches. Even if they had the money, it would have been dangerous to build a church and identify themselves. It was against the law. Then the secular authorities or the people who wanted to hurt them would know where they were, would know where they were meeting and come after them. So the fact that the first century Christians only met in house churches has nothing to do with what we're supposed to do today. So it's a little bit, we've got to be careful when we see these patterns in the book of Acts and we ask ourselves the question, is this a command? Is this a command that has something to do with us? I personally don't think that the requests that the Council of Jerusalem sent to the Gentiles had anything to do with us. The conclusion that they came to was you don't have to become a Jew to become a Christian. That's what's happening in Acts 15. We strive to serve the contemporary Christian community and with a variety of Christian educational and evangelistic resources. To see TVS resource base, please visit tvseminary.com. So it says that, and also they write a letter, they write an official letter, and here's what they say. They say to the Christians in Antioch, we understand that some people, some of our colleagues from Jerusalem have been bothering you. They've been pestering you, insisting that you keep Jewish laws and Jewish rituals, that you've got to do that. We want you to know that we didn't send that message. What they've been telling you is their own opinion. It's not official. Our official position is that you do not have to become Jews, but we don't want you to commit sexual immorality. We don't want you to eat animals which have been strangled or eat blood. We don't want you to eat animals which have been sacrificed to idols. These things are tremendously offensive to Jews. And it's nearly impossible for Jews to get along in a church with Gentiles who are doing these things. Now, when Paul talks about some of these principles in 1 Corinthians, he talks about a strong brother and a weak brother. The weak brother is the one who can't be comfortable unless you're submitting to certain rules. The strong brother realizes it's by grace. We're free of these rules. Now, to be free of the rules and rituals does not mean that we don't obey the commandments. We obey all the commandments. What does grace mean? Grace means that we're not saved by keeping rules. But grace also, that's the pardon. We're pardoned by God. We're forgiven by God because we cannot keep the law. We're forgiven. But grace also gives us the power to keep the commands of God and to do what God says. And there is law with grace in the New Testament. We're commanded. There are all kinds of commands. And the commands start on the inside. The commands of the New Testament are actually harder because the Old Testament tells you you can't commit adultery. The New Testament tells you you cannot want somebody who's married to somebody else. That's harder. The Old Testament tells you you can't commit murder, you can't kill somebody. The New Testament tells us you can't be angry at somebody. That's a lot harder. So we Christians who are under grace, that doesn't mean that we don't have any laws to obey. That doesn't mean that we can do anything we want to do. It simply means that 
we do not become Christians by keeping the law. We don't become Christians. We do not maintain our right standing with God by our obedience, but by Christ's obedience. It's a difference in principle. And it takes a whole lifetime to receive grace and to think by grace and to act by grace because we're so legal and we're so oriented to the flesh and earning our salvation, but it doesn't work. This is what the whole New Testament is about. And this is what the Christians in Jerusalem wrote to the Christians in Antioch about. So they send the letter, verse 30. They get the letter, verse 31, and they're very, very happy. The people that they sent with the letter were Judas and Silas. We're going to hear about Silas later. Judas evidently goes back home to Jerusalem, but Silas stays in Antioch, verse 33, verse 34. He doesn't go home. And it says that Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch, and they were teaching and preaching the word of the Lord. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.